Okay, so welcome back. Uh, I thought we would just switch the air conditioning system off because people seem to be uh, cool enough. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the last talk of the morning session. And that's going to be delivered by uh, Vincenzo, sorry, Enzo, Enzo Marra. And he's going to tell us what a logician's encounter with decision theory is uh, with non-classical fallouts. Thanks very much. So uh, let me start by thanking the organizers warmly for uh, uh, having me here and uh, for asking me to give a, what is supposed to be a tutorial, a tutorial on logic. Uh, it's not an easy task, given such a diverse audience. Um, and in fact, um, I, I'm not sure what the opposite of risk averse is. Maybe it's something like risk prone or something. Well, I, I am like that, so I promise more than I could deliver in my abstract. So you're not getting a lot of non-classical fallouts here. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'll, do, I'll do my best not to, uh, not to bore at least a fraction of you. So there, 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 is, a, there is an occasion also um, for me to be here that makes me particularly happy bes besides having listened to very many interesting talks. And that's that in Milan we are, um, uh, well, have been busy with a, with a project that's, uh, that's an ongoing project and the title is Probability Theory on Non-Classical Events, so at least for... I am, I am a logician by trade, but I also am a mathematician. And so at least probability theory relates very strongly to, to, to economics. Uh, there is also something else. There is um, Thomas Krupa, who is sitting somewhere there, who will be uh, moving to Milan in November for two years, and we will be doing this Marie Curie project, uh, Ordered Algebraic Structures in Game Theory. The interesting thing being, so he's going to be working in my group, the interesting thing here being that Thomas knows about game theory, but I know nothing about game theory. So we uh, hope that uh, we can learn from, uh, from our, for, for example, from our colleagues uh, in Milan at, the, at, the, at another university, Bocconi University. So this is also uh, an interesting prospect for me. So uh, I want to start with, um, uh, just, just to make sure um, um, we are on, we have something that we can all relate to. With the von Neumann-Morgenstern theorem, this has been mentioned many times. I'm probably the one who knows the least about this theorem in this audience, so uh, let's see. Uh, here is an account from the original source. Given a finite set of exhaustive, mutually exclusive, jointly, ex uh, or oh, I mean, uh, mutually exclusive, jointly exhaustive outcomes, let's call it a finite set M, M1MN, let's think of MI as an atomic event, and let's identify it with a standard basis vector in Rn. Then you can take the convex hull of these vectors and it gives you the fundamental, the so-called fundamental simplex of uh, n-tuples of numbers adding up to one, each one being positive. And uh, this is the collection of all probability distributions on M. Um, a point in the simplex is called, uh, I learned, a, a lottery, right? So it is the, to be thought of as the prospect that M1 obtains with probability P1, and if not, then M2 obtains with probability P2, and so on. The vertices are then identified with the elements of M, as we said, and they are just the usual atomic events. Further, we're given a preference relation between lotteries. That's a binary relation, which is just a pre-order. It is transitive and reflexive, therefore. And it defines as such an equivalence relation known as indifference. P is indifferent to Q if and only if these two things hold. And it also defines its strict counterpart. P is uh, strictly less preferred to Q if and only if, uh, or Q is strictly preferred to P if and only if these two things hold. Um, it is further assumed that this is a total or complete pre-order so that uh, any two, any two, uh, oh, there's, there's, there's a typo here, it should be Q less than P. Uh, for, any two, for any P and Q, one of the two alternatives hold. Then uh, one imposes rationality axioms uh, on, on this pre-order, and uh, the two I'm showing here are not exactly the ones in the von Neumann-Morgenstern book. Uh, 
Uh, I will tell you later where the, the source for this is essentially. So uh, it's, uh, uh, the two axioms are the preferences are finely additive, which means that you can uh, go from P, uh, Q strictly preferred to P, to uh, the, any convex combination uh, strictly, uh, strictly preferred to, 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 to the uh, corresponding one. So, um, and then there is a, a further axiom, uh, which is called, um, uh, well, in various ways, uh, I like to call it the Archimedean axiom, for any uh, three uh, lotteries satisfying this, uh, you can combine the two extreme ones uh, so that uh, uh, you go respectively strictly below and strictly above than Q. So there are no um, lotteries which are infinitely preferred to others. And under these conditions, essentially von Neumann and Morgenstern in 1947 in an appendix to their book, but in fact this version is due to Fishburne 1970, uh, approved the following that uh, for any binary relation on delta n, it is equivalent that uh, the relation is a total order satisfying those two axioms and that there is, there exists in a fine linear function u from the simplex to the real such that um, uh, it, uh, the, the, the fine linear function represents the relation in this sense here. So when this is the case, then this function is uniquely determined up to a, uh, a monoid of tra up to some transformations, which is the set of all affine, which is the uh, essentially affine transformations, but with this a positive, with the first coefficient positive. Okay, so that's the standard uh, theorem, or one version of it at least. Um, and uh, this is important because it shows that u is then an expected utility function, being a f which just means that it's a fine linear, so it goes through or co convex combinations, it preserves convex combinations, and therefore the utility of uh, a combination is just the expected utility of the, uh, or the, the expected uh, utility of the, um, of the uh, atomic events. Okay. So what, what, do I, what do I plan to do here? Uh, well, it's a very modest aim. Let's take the von neumann morgensen theorem uh, and, and uh, let's pretend uh, that uh, you are novices to that. I am, but you're not. So. If, and then let's try to look at it uh, with, the, with the eyes of a logician. What, what can logic tell us about, is, is there a role that logic plays in this theorem at all? Maybe the answer is no. In fact, the answer is, 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 is yes, it does play a role. It's uh, a role that we will make explicit, and that's essentially just an excuse to review some standard logic, okay? Um, needless to say, I'm not going to tell you anything new about the von neumann morgens theorem at the end, but we will get back to it to recast it. It's just a reformulation uh, into, into, into logical terms, so to speak. And hopefully this is uh, not an entirely useless uh, prospect, the idea of uh, ex uh, isolating the role of logic in such a, a, a basic result, so that if one wanted uh, to attempt generalizations, one could then have uh, logic as an independent parameter. You can, you can, for example, change the logic. In order to do that, you have to first know exactly what logic has to do with this. Okay, so. Uh, now we, we uh, just uh, embark on a review of classical propositional logic. Um, I will stress the elements that, uh, as far as, as I can tell, are more relevant for, for uh, things like the von neumann morgensen theorem. Uh, but uh, other than that, this material is pretty standard. Of course, the perspective is my personal perspective, but the material is standard. So we have propositional variables or atoms or atomic formula, call, call them what you will, and uh, they stand for basic propositions, and um, it is traditional in logic to take countably many when you do just theoretical pure logic, but it doesn't really matter. You take any set that you like uh, with any cardinality. Um, then you have two symbols, two specific symbols, uh, the verum and the falsum, that stand for, proposition, for a proposition that is always true and a proposition that is always false, respectively. And then you construct compound formulae using the standard logical connectives. So you have 
uh, this for disjunction, which is inclusive disjunction, uh, this for conjunction, uh, implication, and negation. These are the standard basic connectives. Um, how do you construct formula, uh, compound formula? Well, uh, in, in the standard way, it's a recursive definition. The logical constants, Verum and Falsum, are, are formula, and then you keep going, all proposition variables are formula, and then you keep going with the building uh, disjunctions, conjunctions, uh, implications, and negations, and there you have your language. Um, let's write form, uh, formula, for the set of formula over the given propositional variables. Then, uh, this is not logic, this is formal languages up to now, a very tiny fragment of formal languages. Logic begins when you uh, concentrate on syntax versus semantics. So let me start from the semantic side. We construct now uh, a formal semantics to interpret formulae. So we consider assignments of truth values, also called evaluations, interpretations. There are, there are many names for, for, these, uh, for these functions. They are just functions from the formula to uh, a two-element set, which for convenience we write out as just zero and one. And the, the function is to be, uh, is subjected to the usual conditions which define what in elementary treatments are called truth tables. They tell you ex uh, the, the, the semantic conditions that uh, make formula true if we identify one with true and zero with false. So uh, the, the, I'm not going to read them in detail. They are, I guess, uh, known to everybody. So a conjunction will be true if and only if both conjuncts are valued true and so on. Um, naturally, implication is material implication. So it, it, it is actually equivalent semantically to not alpha or beta. So the uh, linguistic rendering if alpha then beta is, it, it, it's not a good model of natural language. It's not meant to be. Logic is not meant to be a good model of natural language. Uh, classical logic, I'm saying. So this is the usual material implication. And um, observations, evaluation is subject to no restriction concerning the values as assigned to propositional variables. You have no restrictions on atoms. Okay? You just give zeros and ones the way you like. And it is uniquely determined by the values you decide to assign to the atoms. This is called the principle of truth functionality. Uh, or compositionality uh, after Gottlob Frege, one of the founding fathers of uh, modern logic. And it just tells you that uh, you can compute the truth value of a compound formula if you know the truth values of the, of the, um, of the constituents, something which uh, notoriously does not happen, for example, in probability theory. So following a tradition that goes back at least to Leibniz, uh, it is useful to think, it's just the name here, you see, I'm not uh, introducing a new notion, but it's useful to think of valuations as possible worlds. Possible worlds, um, this I uh, stress for my uh, fellow logicians actually, do not exist just in, many, in model logic. Possible worlds, in, in, in this sense, possible valuations, uh, you know, they are already there in classical logic. It's the collection of all possible valuations. Uh, why does it make sense to think of evaluation as a possible world? Well, because uh, for a logician, for a classical logician, a world is simply identify with the, the collection of true atomic propositions that one can utter in that world with truth. Okay, so it's 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 a very abstract, it's very ethereal notion. It's not uh, uh, no other um, aspects of the world are considered when you're doing logic. Just the sentences that you can utter with truth. Okay, they, they determine the world. So now, um, analytic truths, that's the traditional terminology or modern terminology, even though it looks like a Greek word, tautology is a modern word. Tautologies, uh, because it was introduced by Wittgenstein, uh, are defined as those formulae which are true in every possible world. It's very easy, right? So that they are necessarily true in that sense. Uh, it is such that for whichever valuation you pick, uh, that valuation will evaluate alpha to one. Okay. So then, uh, examples of tautologies. Uh, some of these are uh, very well known to everybody. Tertium non datur, ex falso quod libet, um, um, 
and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read them, just, just examples. So these are formulae which it doesn't matter where, I mean, how you decide to pick your value, logical valuation, they will come out true. Right? There is, of course, infinitely many of them. Uh, so let's collect them in a set, tout. Of, uh, of formula, which is just a subset of, of the set of all formula. It is a proper subset. And the standard notation here would be to write uh, this symbol here to mean that alpha is an element of tau. Um, now, th this is the formal semantics. But logic, as I was mentioning, is concerned with the relationship between uh, syntax and semantics, so language and the world. And therefore, we need a syntactic counterpart of the notion of tautology. And that syntactic counterpart is called a provable formula, or also a theorem in the logic. This is not a theorem about the logic. It's a provable formula in the system. But logicians say, ah, it's a theorem in that sense. So what, what is it? Uh, well, uh, to, to, uh, first of all, some notation. To say that alpha formula follows from a certain set of assumptions beta i, read alpha is provable given the assumptions but I, um, we need to define axioms and a consequence relation, two ingredients, axioms and consequence relations. So first we select axioms, which are just a set of formula which we mm, assume that they're already proved by definition. They don't, we don't need a proof for axioms. And then we select deduction rules, possibly more than one, but actually you will see that we use just one in classical logic, that tells us that if we already establish the formula alpha 1, alpha n, finite list are provable, and those have a certain shape, then a specific formula beta can be deduced from that. Okay? So the, the deduction rule is just modus ponens, which everybody knows. If you prove the alpha and you prove that alpha implies beta, then you prove beta. As you can see, the only connective that plays a role here is implication. And that's uh, what gives uh, the, the prominent role to implication in, in, in logic, because it is connected to provability. Uh, now, formally, we declare that the formula is provable if there is a proof of alpha. As I said, it's a final list of formulas such that each formula, so that the last formula is alpha, the formula to be proved, and the remaining items in the list are either axioms or are deducible from previous items in the list by an application of modus ponens. I stress here that this is a strictly finitary notion. There's no infinite concern here. It's a finite list and the, 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 the uh, deduction rule is fully computable in an obvious, and, I mean, it's trivially computable. So this is, uh, that's also why logic is related to computability, although I won't say anything about it, but this is, there is an intrinsic uh, finitary nature in logic which is important to stress. Okay, right theorem for the set of provable formula. We still need to define the axioms. Now there are many possible choices here. I will just for the, just not to leave this uh, sort of as a mysterious thing, I'll give you uh, a one possible axiomatization which goes back to Frege. And uh, it is very, um, um, uh, it, it uses very little, you see. It's uh, six axioms, and the only connectives you see here are negation and implication. The others are actually definable from these. Um, I'm not going to read uh, the axioms in detail. Uh, probably you are familiar with all of them, most of them. Uh, this one, A3, is a bit more complicated, but uh, when you right, uh, when you uh, realize that this junction can be defined in this manner from implication, then these axioms read in this manner, and so this just says essentially that uh, these junctions are commutative. Okay? Uh, as a curiosity, also notice that uh, the consequentia mirabilis, bec A5, becomes tertium non datur when you replace uh, uh, implications by, 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 by disjunctions, uh, by when you write disjunction as, um, as it is defined in terms of implication. Okay, so that's just one possible axiomatization. Uh, it's very economical. Then you just have modus ponens as a deduction rule, and there you have your formal deductive system. Okay? Um, you can define the remaining connectives uh, and, and many more derived ones, for example. So these are the definitions of um, disjunctions and conjunctions. This is uh, a connective which is the biconditional. Alpha implies beta and beta implies alpha. 
which if, you can, if your logic proves that, it tells you that alpha and beta essentially say the same thing up to syntax. They are different formula. A string of symbols, they are different. But if the logic proves that alpha um, uh, implies beta and beta implies alpha, then uh, a trivial exercise shows that uh, any evaluation w will give the same truth value to alpha and to beta. Okay? So in that sense, if in contexts, such as, for example, when you pass to Boolean algebras, where you're not interested in the specific syntactic shape of a formula, but, but only in its meaning, then you quotient over the equivalence relation, which is called the tarski lindemann relation, given by alpha is equivalent to beta if and only if it is provable that alpha uh, implies beta and beta implies alpha. Okay? And then you mod out syntax. All right. Um, now, is it to show validity theorem for any alpha, for any formula, if there is a proof of alpha, then alpha is true in every possible world. In other words, the theorems are a subset of the tautologies. Proof, it's a triviality. Axioms are tautologies by direct inspection, exercise. And modus ponens produces tautologies from tautologies because of the way we define material implication, because of the semantics of implication. The weird aspects of material implication with respect to natural language, if then, come, I mean, wh why, why do logicians choose to define implication that way? Because they want to have this. You, you, need, to, you need to define material implication in that, in that sort of um, counterintuitive way, in some sense, um, so that if you say that, uh, you know, if, if, um, if donkeys fly, uh, uh, and so is, is silly, this is, uh, this is a true sentence, right? Because the antecedent is false. Uh, so uh, we need to define it that way in order to guarantee this. It's harder to show the converse, that if a formula alpha is true in every possible world, then there is a proof of alpha, a finite list of formulas such that you can derive it from the axioms. I'm not going to tell you, so when you put these things together, you get uh, the soundness and completeness theorem that Tautologies and theorems are the same thing. As a set, they are coextensive. Now, I'm not going to prove this uh, theorem, uh, but I will tell you something about a proof of a stronger result in a minute. And why do I want to do that? Because this theorem in itself is of interest to logicians. It's of no interest to, for example, economists or somebody else. It only speaks about the pure logic. It only speaks about analytic truths. I will return to this point. To speak about factual truths, we need to take theories over the logic. The pure logic will not tell you anything. So, what are theories? Well, they are those things that, exp that uh, help us to answer the question, what can logic teach us about the world? The world now, not in the sense of uh, the possible worlds of logicians, but the actual world. Well. Uh, logic is just concerned with the form of an argument and not with its contents. So suppose we have a proposition P, the coin lands heads, and a proposition Q, the coin lands tails. It's intuitively obvious that either P or Q must be true. So can, uh, does, the, does the logic prove this, P, P or Q? That, can we prove that from the axioms of the logic? Well, obviously not, because P and Q are atoms, X1 and X2, okay? And... Um, <laughs> It, if we could prove this by soundness, this would be a tautology, but obviously P or Q is not a tautology. You just give to P value zero and to Q value zero. So what is the point I'm making here? That it's an obvious point, but uh, it's easy to forget it. Our formal system does not know our intended interpretation of these two atoms. They are just two atomic propositional formula. So if we want to, f to encode the additional knowledge that corresponds to the interpretation that we have in mind of the coin lens heads and the coin lens tails, we have to pick a, a, an additional set of assumptions about P and Q. So set S, the, 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 pick, uh, to let S be the set con consisting of the single formula P if and only if not Q, then yes, we can prove P or Q under the additional set of assumptions S. Okay, the notation for this is S proves alpha. It means you, there, is a, uh, there is a proof of alpha from the axioms of the logic where each time you say, uh, this is, uh, this is um, legitimate here because it is an axiom, you can also say, or because it lies in S, okay? 
So you can use S as an additional set of assumptions, formally in the deductions. So if you have the proposition coin lens heads, you have just two possible worlds, zero and one. Uh, looking ahead a little bit, when you take probabilities, you take the convex hull of this. But if you're only interested in logic, you just have these two points here. And if you have coin lens heads and a second proposition coin lens tails, you know, if you know nothing about E and F, then these four are the possible worlds. Adding the additional assumption that I mentioned will uh, throw away two of the possible worlds and leave you with just the two possible worlds which um, model our, um, our intended, semantically, our intended interpretation of the two formula. Okay? So, we can now answer this. What is it that a set of additional assumptions encodes? Encodes our knowledge or your knowledge about the world. In this case, that either the coin lands heads or it lands tails and tertium and what? And we can ask a further question. Does S encode complete knowledge about the world? And the answer is no in this example, because there are two possible worlds, heads or tails, right? Uh, a, a way to say that is that S does not encode complete knowledge because it can be properly increased, enlarged, without precipitating a consistency. Um, for example, you may know that uh, how, how do we increase knowledge when we are tossing a coin? Well, you may know that, uh, that uh, the coin is fake and bears two heads, for example, right? So then you add a further axiom, a further assumption to S. There are maximal consistent extensions of S, which are those extensions of the set of assumptions which are still consistent, but they are not, um, but, uh, but they're not further enlargeable. These are called maximal consistent extensions. Um, what do I mean when I say that uh, a set of assumptions is inconsistent? I just mean that it allows you to prove the constant falsum or any other contradiction, okay? That's, that's inconsistency. Um, in, in this example, you just check by hand, right? I mean, you just sort of, if I add one of those two atoms, I'm throwing away one of these two possible worlds, I'm left with only one, and then you have to, um, uh, you have to prove in this specific example that they are. I'm just claiming that they are here. It's, it is true, but in general, it's a good question, actually, because what I wanted to get at is, um, a result which guarantees to us that there exist maximal consistent extensions. But uh, before doing that, let me give you a, a more formal treatment of the ideas I just, I just uh, sketched. So a theory in classical logic, or in any logic, in fact, is any set of formula that is closed under provability. That's the technical definition. So that is deductively closed. Uh, if I, so this means you have a set of formula. If, if this set of formula proves something, that formula is already in there, okay? so. For any set of formula, the smallest theory that extends S, the inclusion smallest theory that extends S exists. It is, it's, co it's called its deductive closure, and it's defined by alpha belongs to the deductive closure if and only if S proves alpha, right? What is the deductive closure of the empty set? It's the set of theorems. It's the things you can prove from the axioms of the logic alone, okay? No additional assumptions. Uh, a theory is consistent if it does not coincide with the entire set of formula. So now, recall, a theory is deductively closed. So if it proves uh, uh, the falsum, the falsum is already in theta, and then using the ex-falso quadlibet quad axiom together with modus ponens, you can show that you can deduce any formula, okay? So to say that the theory is inconsistent, assuming that it's deductively closed, is the same thing as saying that it con coincides with the entire set of formula, okay? Um, a theory now is maximally consistent or maximal consistent or even just maximal. If it is consistent, it doesn't prove a contradiction. And whenever alpha is a formula that does not belong to the theory, then if you add it to the theory and take the deductive closure, you fall into inconsistency. All right? Okay. Now, we can extend this terminology to arbitrary sets of formula, not just to deductively closed sets of formula. Take a set S. There is an associated theory, namely its deductive closure, and we say that S axiomatizes S uh, deductive closure. The, the, the set S now, which is not deductively closed, is consistent if its deductive closure is, okay? And it is maximal consistent if its deductive closure is maximal consistent, okay? 
Now, some easy facts here. For any set of formula, S is consistent if and only if, uh, okay, uh, depends what you're taking as definition here. If you take that um, uh, consistency means, co inconsistency means deductive closure equal the entire set of formula, then this is a remark. S is consistent if and only if it doesn't prove the falsum. And importantly, the following are equivalent. S is maximal consistent if and only if, pick any formula you like, then either this is a consequence of S or its negation is a consequence of S, but not both, okay? Maximal consistency means that for any formula you pick, there is a proof from the set of assumptions, either of that formula or of its negation, okay? And yes. Sorry, I didn't hear. How can you be sure that even though there's no inconsistent, inconsistency in the set, you cannot prove everything from it? Is there like a proof? Uh, yeah, uh, it will be, um, it's, it's a consequence of uh, the completeness theorem, the soundness and completeness actually, but in the version that I'm about to show you. Uh, I mean, not the version uh, which we just saw before, but the one we're getting at. But uh, what you're saying is true, yes, and it can be proved. Okay, so the, the key lemma here is the following. It's called Lindemann's lemma after Adolf Lindemann, one of the Polish logicians of the great Polish school in logic of the f f first half of the former century. For any consistent set of formula, there is a maximal consistent theory that extends it. So you, can, you have any set of formula you like, even empty, there is a set of, um, there, is, there is a way of enlarging it to a set of formula which is deductively closed and it is maximally consistent. Um, it's ob it should be obvious that this extension is very, very, very far from unique, okay? There are many, many such extensions. The important thing is that there exists one. Um, the, the, the proof of this lemma is non-constructive, very heavily non-constructive. It uses the axiom of choice, and in fact, a little less than the axiom of choice, but I'm not getting into that, mm, because in many mm, uh, contexts, constructivity is not relevant, but some logicians are interested in constructivity, so they're interested in studying logics where you don't use the, the axiom of choice, but that's another story. So. Why is this lemma important? Recall the easy fact, for any alpha, uh, S proves alpha, or S proves not alpha, but not both, in case S is maximally consistent, then Lindemann's lemma allows the construction of evaluation, you see? It gives a, a key link from syntax to semantics. If you give me a maximally consistent theta, um, oh, sorry, I, I'm, S, I'm assuming here, is maximally consistent now, this S here. So then I can construct W from the formula to zero, 1. I just pick a formula and I say, okay, W of alpha is 1 if and only if S proves it. And this is a well-defined function because S is maximally consistent, I'm assuming here, and therefore it has the property of proving alpha or its negation for each alpha. So that's a fully defined function and it turns out, it's an easy computation, that it's a valuation. So, so you see what we want to do here is we start with a set of formula which is not maximal consi maximally consistent but just consistent. We want to construct a model of it, a, a concrete model in the semantics, evaluation, right? How do we do it? We apply Lindenbaum, you extend to a big maximally consistent set and that thing gives you evaluation that will evaluate S, uh, will be a model of S. So taking stock, any consistent theory has a model. This is what the Lindenbaum's lemma grants you. It's crucial that you need to be consistent. If you're inconsistent, there is no model, okay? Uh, so, in other words, there is a possible world where the theory actually holds, okay? Evaluation where the theory actually holds, if you are consistent. This, this theorem has a counterpart at the first order level, at, um, uh, when you use uh, quantifications and predicates. That uh, was proved by Gödel. And uh, what it says is that if you talk so long as you don't contradict yourself, you're always talking about something. You see? I mean, it's not, you have a model always, okay? Um, so there is a semantic counterpart of S proves alpha and, the, the, and, and of the deductive closure of S. It is that if you take a set, a formula is a semantic now consequence of the set written in this manner. If for any, as mo any model that satisfies alpha, S satisfies alpha. 
In other words, any assignment of truth values such that each formula in S's value is uh, sent to true uh, sends alpha to true, right? Alpha is true in all those models where S is true. And the notation here is that uh, th this denotes the closure of S under semantic consequence. You add in all formula which are semantic consequence of it. Observe that if you take the semantic closure of the empty set, you're just asking for those formula which are true in every possible world to cool. And therefore, you're talking about tautologies. So that's the semantic closure of the empty set is the, is the set of tautologies, just like previously the deductive closure of the empty set of assumptions was the theorems. Now, the strong completeness theorem for classical logic, which is important here, is that for any formula and any set of assumptions, S models alpha if and only if S proves alpha. So uh, alpha is a semantic consequence of S if and only if alpha is a syntactic consequence of S. In other words, syntactic consequence and syntactic uh, semantic consequence coincide. Uh, here you have to apply Lindemann's lemma. If you take for S the empty set, you get back the completeness theorem that we saw before, right? Now, why, why is, is this important, the strong completeness theorem, and its corollary, the completeness theorem, is, is as I'm writing here, useless for applications? Well, because uh, logic by itself will not tell you anything about your specific domain of application, you see? And this, not in a general vague sense, in a strictly technical, precise sense, logic is analytical. So logic can teach us nothing factual, okay? nothing at all. Uh, it, it can model our factual or synthetic, extra logical, non-analytical knowledge by encoding it into a consistent theory. But of course, you are the one who has to pick what consistent theory to, to, to choose. In other words, you have previous synthetic factual knowledge about uh, decision theory, and you can maybe write down a theory in classical logic that says something about that domain of application. If you don't have that theory, logic will tell you nothing. Yes. Um, I mean, logic can, can help you uh, showing maybe that your set of assumptions was inconsistent. But yes, because you start with a finite set of assumptions or, or any set of assumptions, and then you work with the machinery of the logic and you prove a contradiction. And then you realize, ah, my assumptions were inconsistent. This is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is this is true. This is true. Okay, if you mean it in this general sense that logic can tell you something, okay, but it's it's actually something about pure logic. It doesn't it doesn't matter whether you're speaking about economics or whether you're speaking about uh, um, uh, you know horse racing. It's totally the same. Anything that has a model is consistent. This is so. In particular, in applications, what do you do? You have um, a, a, a fragment of reality, and you know that some statements are true there, right? You pick those and you make them into axioms because you think they are important statements. Then you're sure that there is a model because you took statements which were true somewhere. There is a, the, the issue is not whether there is a model or not there. The issue is whether those statements are strong enough to capture essential features of your intended single model. So, but yes. Yes, yes. In, in, okay, now here we have to distinguish between general philosophical logic and mathematical logic. In mathematical logic, it's wired into the definitions that the world is consistent, okay? Whether you can make philosophical sense of such a statement the world is inconsistent, uh, I'm not the best person to answer, but I mean, uh, it's, not, it's not relevant here. So, once more, logic, will not teach us anything factual. I mean, this is, if you like, a triviality. I'm doing this really at an elementary level, but it's very easy to forget it, especially for the younger people here. When you read, uh, next paper you read tells you that, they try to tell you that because they're using a specific logical formalism, it could be a very complex polymodal logic and so on, 
that thing will tell something new about a specific factual domain of um, investigation, well, don't believe them. That's not true. Logic is analytical. It cannot do that. Uh, knowledge must be encoded by theories. Okay. Um, how, so it's important we can use it to model factual theory by uh, encoding that into consistent theories. And it's also important that maximal consistent theories encode complete knowledge. Which is something that happens very rarely, of course. Uh, mm, co maximal consistent theories, as I try to show, they encode complete knowledge that an agent has about the world and they determine the world wherein the agent is. That valuation W that we constructed, if you start from a maximally consistent theory, it's unique. So there is only one model, okay? Uh, I mean, yes. <laughs> so repetita humant, how do we, uh, what is the logical approach to, to agents and knowledge? Well, uh, this is the very basic, then you can do a lot more, of course, but one agent is just a consistent set of formula, you see? That's what one agent is. The formula encode the agent's knowledge about the world. The set of alternatives, uh, or the sample space, I mean, use the name that you will according to the context, is the set of, this is important, the set of possible worlds that are models of S. If you go through the pain of taking a logical approach and writing the formula that encode the agent's knowledge, then you don't have to guess the space of alternatives. The space of alternatives is there for you. There is a canonical one. And if there is one canonical notion in mathematics, this is it. It's fully canonical, okay? So you don't have to guess it. Of course, it might be easier sometimes to, to work semantically and say, well, let's, I, I already know directly what the basic outcomes are. Let's take them. Sure, I mean, this is what's done most of the time, actually. But in principle, if you, if you d took the, 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 the trouble to, to, to express um, uh, knowledge explicitly, formalize it in, in the logic, then you have your sample space. What are events? Events are formulae okay, that describe things that might or might be, might be true or might not be true. Okay, so now an agent has partial knowledge, partial knowledge, if and only if the set of assumptions says when you take its adaptive closure, it's not maximally consistent. All right, so that means an agent has partial knowledge precisely when the canonical set of space of alternatives has more than one alternative. All right. There is more than one possible world, and that's where probability theory begins. Logic ends here, properly speaking. It's not going to be able to tell you which of those possible worlds is the actual world, whatever that means, okay? I mean, the knowledge you have gives you the worlds, and that's it. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay, so now I, I really pick up some speed. And I apologize for this, but I, I wanted to give you something. This is totally elementary. It's just a perspective on. So now uh, I use more machinery, okay? And I don't take the trouble to define everything. Please interrupt me anytime to ask. One does algebraization here. Logic corresponds to Boolean algebras. Up to isomorphism, there is a bijection between Boolean algebras with less than uh, kappa generators, kappa any cardinal, and consistent theories in classical logic over kappa variables. This kappa variables is the atoms you pick, okay? If you want to get all Boolean algebras, you need to use arbitrarily large sets of uh, atoms, okay? Uh, fixing a Boolean algebra B, think of events, is the same thing as, or it's equivalent, to fixing a consistent theory in classical logic, okay? So encoding the, th so we already said the theory encodes the, th the agent's knowledge. So consistent theory or Boolean algebra, same thing. You're fixing the agent's knowledge. Events then become elements of the Boolean algebra, okay? They're not formula anymore, they're elements of an algebra. Uh, possible worlds, so this, the canonical sample space is the same thing as homomorphisms from the given Boolean algebra to the two-element Boolean algebra. That's the same thing as a logical valuation in algebraic form, okay? Homomorphism means that, that it's functions that preserve the operations of the Boolean algebra, okay? Those are the possible worlds. Now, the agent encodes his belief about which of the possible worlds is the actual world, now this is beyond logic, this is probability, into a provision, as Definetti said, which everybody else calls this an expectation, but I mean, a, a provision, okay? A function P from B to 0, 1, satisfying normalization and finite additivity, finite additivity. So, P of the true event is 1, and P of this junction is the sum if the events are incompatible, okay? If the conjunction is... 
that's that's what that's what the the agent does to encode his um, belief. But I mean, but but, but I mean, yeah. But I mean, uh, uh, the uh, random numbers. Are, 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 this is just a special case. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, finally, added the probability. Okay. Uh, the crucial fact is that now this is uh, more advanced, but it's also important. Um, unless variables or atoms in the logic are finite in number, the set of possible world is not a set. It's not just a set, it's a topological space, okay? And this happens whether you like it or not. You may say, well, I don't want the topology. No, you, you, can, you can choose not to see it, but it's there, okay? Um, the intuition is that some possible words are closer, are close to others, okay? It's not just like a set with a discrete topology. Example for those interested in the sigma versus finite additivity debate in the infinite lottery where a ticket n is drawn at random, is drawn from, uh, from, from, from the set of natural numbers. Uh, if you model the situation, this is an infinite lottery, right? Intuition would, wa would, would, want, to, would want it to have some sort of um, uniform distribution over this, right? Now, if you model things with, uh, with events and Boolean algebras, you can use random variables here. That's a, that makes a difference, but if you use events, okay, then there necessarily is a possible world such that in that world, no ticket at all is withdrawn. <coughs> this, is, this comes from the finitarity of the logic. Okay, uh, what happens is the following, that you, you would like to have as a sample space this, right? Okay, the natural numbers. Um, this being the atom, the, 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 sub, the singleton here, meaning uh, ticket I wins, okay? But when you formalize this in, in, with a Boolean algebra, right, uh, the least you can do is to take all the singletons and generate with those a Boolean algebra, right? This Boolean algebra is called the finite cofinite algebra, and it is very, because I'll tell you what it is now, and that explains the name, and it is very far from taking all subsets of the natural numbers. All subsets of the natural numbers is huge compared to this, okay? Now, this is a small Boolean algebra, so to speak, it's infinite. Um, it looks like uh, the following. An L a subset of n is in here, if and only if it's either a finite set or its complement is a finite set. Finite cofinite Boolean algebra, okay? It's a Boolean algebra. Now, take possible worlds over this. Each one of these points is a possible world, but there is an added point which looks like this. It's a limit point of the others. Call it alpha. This is what's called in mathematics. It's the one point compactification of this discrete space. It makes it into a topological space. That point is a possible world. It's the valu logical valuation that says, uh, if you have a propositional variable xi that says ticket i is winning, there is a logical valuation that says xi zero for each i. That's, that's compatible with the, with, with the situation here. So now, um, you see, if you don't do it like this, you don't see this point. You don't, just don't see it. Now, what, what are the ways? Way? So in fact, it's not, strictly speaking, correct to say that uh, you can take n as a sample space. Because uh, that does, doesn't simply does, doesn't work. I can give more details on this, but uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm going on now to say a couple of more things, and then maybe uh, if there are questions on this, I wasn't clear enough. We can get back to it. Um, the the phenomenon that um, that Boolean algebras come with sets of I mean sample spaces which are topological is a is an instance of uh, a beautiful piece of mathematics which is called stone duality. And it explains in full the relationship between syntax and semantics. It is, uh, the, the, I'm not, I'm being very sketchy here, it's like Alice going through the looking glass, you see. Syntax is on one side, semantics is on the other side, and one thing that you can get very easily wrong if you, if you, don't, if you don't look more deeply into these things is that when you step through the mirror, the arrows reverse. 
there is a contravariant phenomenon. This is crucial and uh, things become, uh, therefore, a little tricky to handle. But the general idea is this, if you have just any Boolean algebra B, the set, so events, okay, the set of possible worlds is not a set, it's a space. It's the most general compact Hausdorff zero-dimensional space. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. It's a, it, compact Hausdorff is a standard notion. Zero-dimensional means it has a basis of sets which are uh, at the same time closed and open. Think of these as thin, thin spaces. Okay? You don't get a, a Euclidean space out of this. Okay? But they, are, they, are, they can be fairly general spaces. For example, they fail to be metrizable very easily, okay? if you take B large enough. Um, let's call it M. It's the same M that appears in the von neumann morgenstern theorem, except that it's in a more general version, okay? Now, each element, um, sorry, that's a typo, in the algebra, in B, determines a continuous function from this space to the two-element set with discrete topology on the domain. This is the characteristic function of the formula, okay? It's got to be continuous with respect to this topology. It can be just a, a characteristic function in the naive set theoretic sense. Of course, in the finite case, everything reduces to sets, okay? Um, conversely, each such function comes from a uniquely determined element of B. Now, provisions over events, or finitely additive probabilities over events, arise by averaging the truth values of the formula regarded as functions over the possible worlds. That's what happens, you see? That's why De Finetti said, uh, in a beautiful Italian sentence, Prob la probabilità è una mistura di possibilità. Probability is a mixture of possibilities. That refers to the convex hull business, but also to, the, to, to what I'm uh, hinting at here, which is the risk representation theorem for Boolean algebras. It says the following. I mean, if, if there is somebody here who is who's, who's, who's not uh, comfortable by staring at an integral, this is, uh, just think of the, uh, I mean, I know many people know a lot here, but for the younger ones, don't be scared. I mean, this is very, very intuitive, and it's important what it says. It says, if you take your events, a Boolean algebra of events, there is a space of possible worlds. We just learned that it's a space, it's not a set, okay? And we just learned that any element A, any event, has a continuous characteristic function. Okay, that's the course of values, as Frege would have it, of the formula, right? Now, if you fix a measure mu on the space M, a Borel measure, so a measure on the sigma algebra of, Frege, of uh, open, uh, generated by the open sets, then you can take, because the function is continuous, you can integrate it uh, against that measure, okay? Take the integral, you're just averaging it, right? Taking the average of the truth values it takes across all possible worlds, and the result, will be a real number between 0 and 1. Now, this assignment defines a bijection between the measure that you can pick on the space of possible worlds, the regular Borel measure, to be technically precise, and the provisions on B. Okay? So it shows you that when you fix a finitely additive uh, provision on the Boolean algebra, what you're actually doing is your average and truth value. In the most general possible sense, I have no assumption on B, okay? And the thing is that there is something to be noticed here that most philosophers, uh, I'm, I, I'm afraid, missed in the sigma additivity versus finite additivity debate. Most of the fuss about that is due to a lack of understanding of stone duality. P, the provision, is finitely additive on B, but it induces canonically a sigma additive measure, a good old measure, on the dual space, the stone space of the algebra, canonically. Okay? Every finitely additive measure, um, uh, probability um, uh, function, comes with uh, an associated sigma additive one. Okay? You have to step through the looking glass. You have to go to the dual. You have to go to, to, to the stone dual, right? Okay. Ten minutes? Okay. So, uh, there are versions of the risk representation theorem which, is, which are more general than this, and uh, the, the people from, uh, you, you have actually seen it uh, mentioned and used, uh, or at least underlying uh, several of the talks from the, from the people at Bocconi, because they, uh, the, the, <laughs> I guess they use the risk representation theorem um, almost daily, probably. It's, it's an important theorem, in, in, for example, in economics, but you see, it, it plays a key role in logic, too, in this Boolean version. No, Definetti was not aware of that. Uh, 
Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, Definetti has, there are many good things to say for Definetti, and I'm, I'm one, one of his uh, fans, so to speak, but uh, there are many bad things to say about him, too. That, that I guess, applies to all of us. So, so the Bull and von neumann morgensen theorem, I now perform an idle exercise, idle uh, at least uh, in some sense. I mean, I just recast uh, the theorem in, in the terms I explained to you now, using logic, bringing the logic explicitly. So what we learned is, what can logic do for us? It simply can tell you about the space of alternatives. The rest is extra logical, okay? And so what you do is, uh, let, let's use the, the, the language of the definite betting game. So um, you have, uh, uh, a better, which I like to call Blaise, and uh, uh, he wants to bet on Italy's scores in the match against France. You can see that the slides are slightly outdated, but um, um, so he sets stakes on, on, on the event he, he cares to bet about. You heard about this from Tommaso, for example, in his talk from Tommaso Flaminio, and then he goes looking for a book, bookmaker, and I like to call the bookmaker Ada. It's a palindromic name. She must be reversible, otherwise the theorem doesn't work. Um, the, the book Ada publishes is something like this, and then there is the usual exchange of uh, money, 25 cents now, if those are the figures, and uh, the payback later, the payoff later. Okay, that's the usual stuff. Probability theory deals with events described by formula in classical logics, at least if, uh, until you introduce random variables. <laughs> okay. Um, now, B is any bool in algebra of events. Let M be its space of possible worlds. I'm not putting conditions on B. Ada chooses her book. That's uh, a book of betting quotients. It's a finitely additive measure on B. Conversely, each such book, um, you can think that there is some bookmaker, ideally, that publishes that book, because it's a co coherent one in, in the sense of definite, right? So it's, it's not illogical, right? Uh, so you take the set of all of those. It's a set of all finitely additive probability measures on B to be thought of as all possible bookmakers, right? And then... Um, it's an easy fact that this delta B is naturally a compact convex uh, set in general infinite dimensional. It's, it's the fundamental simplex that featured in the von neumann morgenstern theorem, but there it's, it's a finite dimensional object because you had finitely many atomic events. Now B is arbitrary. Observe that the set of lotteries in the original theorem is here replaced by the set of uh, these finitely additive probability assignments, which, careful here, by Ries representation coincide with regular prob probability measures on delta B, and then, now there's a further step in the, in the elementary presentation of von neumann morgensen they are identified with distributions, which is something else. One thing is measure, one thing is distribution. You can't always describe a measure, which is a set function, by giving numbers on the atoms, you see? And when, that's a very strong assumption. When you can do that, you need to have absolute continuity and several other things. So, um, Really, the generalization of von neumann morgenstern to a, a more general setting requires that you go from distribution, you can stick to distributions. I don't think that's natural, conceptually. You need to go from distributions to measures, which is what we're doing here. Now, Blaise is undecided about whom to place his bets with. Shall he choose uh, Ada P or Ada P prime? Which bookmaker? Uh, he may not know how to choose this straight away, but he has preferences, uh, so this binary relation. As far as I understand, and I would like to be corrected here if I'm wrong, um, the question of why he has those pre he prefers A to B is not relevant here. It's an abstract preference relation. Blaise is not going to tell us why he prefers one to the other, but he must satisfy axioms, okay? Uh, now, it makes sense to apply the very same axioms uh, to finite additive probability uh, measures because they form a convex set, so you can do a fine additivity and all that stuff. And then the theorem reads as follows. If B is finite, this is the assumption that they have in the von neumann morgenstern theorem, uh, then you get exactly what you had before. Um, uh, and, if, uh, and if you want to generalize, if you follow this sort of logical perspective, you would naturally require B not to be, inf not to be finite anymore. And now that doesn't mean that the set of alternatives that you started with becomes infinite. It means that it becomes a topological space, right? As I try to explain, because you, it's uh, it, because that's what stone duality tells us. 
there are such generalizations in the literature, I guess. I'm not an expert now. I mean, there will be generalizations, I guess, to, to compact house spaces, maybe. But it's interesting to realize that that finiteness assumption can be extremely uh, misleading because uh, it's proper generalization. It's not the obvious one. It's not just drop the finiteness. It's drop the finiteness on the events, not on the sample space, all right? And that leads to a naturally topological situation. If, if, if I were a novice in the field of, uh, of uh, decision theory and economics, which I am, but I mean, if I were also a novice in, math in mathematics, maybe I would be, uh, from the t beautiful talks I've seen here, sometimes you see, okay, here is a finite thing, blah, blah, blah. Now, now let's do the general setting. Here is a compact house space. And if you're a novice, you go like, well, from finite to compact house isn't there some middle course? I mean, it's a big generalization. The reason is essentially this, that you need topology at some st stage, you see? And you need it for logical reasons. Okay, so now, uh, as an epilogue, uh, suppose that Blaise uh, wants to bet on the following event. Italy scores late in the match against France. It's a variation of the previous problem. Then he has stakes as before, propositions, and he goes looking for uh, some ADA that would take the bet. But now no ADA, no bookmaker takes that kind of bet. Why? because it's unclear what the game would be, right? What does it mean that that thing happens <laughs> to score late? What's the payoff? Um, the problem here is a logical one. It's the fact that late x, like red x, tall x, is a vague predicate. It's vague. It's vague to say that, that some instant in time is late. Uh, these vague predicates have been given much attention by analytical philosophers and more recently also by non-classical logicians or logicians like myself. And there are many ways that you go from classic, can go from classical to non-classical. I mean, there isn't just one non-classical logic, but one way is to think about the situation. Usual predicates are precise. You have the natural numbers, the prime numbers. You have an extension, the numbers which are uh, prime, and an anti-extension, the complement, the numbers which are composite. But what about if you talk about the set of all red codes within the set of all codes? Where are the boundaries? What is the extension? What is the anti-extension? Um, so, is there a probability theory of events described by such vague propositions as being um, uh, scoring late? Well, the real question, I hope to have convinced you, or at least a necessary preliminary question is, is there a logic of those propositions to begin with? And is it just classical logic, maybe? Could be, you know. Some people claim that. I disagree. But um, if not, which non-classical logic is it? Well, it is something that I just uh, give you as a piece of information, but I do not. This is an epilogue. I'm done. I, I do not uh, explain. Um, we do have a logic, which uh, I claim, and you may disagree, but you have to look at the, at the, at the theorems and the things that models certain vague predicates appropriately. And it's called Vukasiewicz logic, and you heard it mentioned already in previous talks. Uh, Chang uh, was um, the mathematician who provided the algebraization of Vukasiewicz logic, which leads you from Boolean algebras to MV algebras, which you already uh, heard about. So then you have an entire dictionary that generalizes from events, from Boolean algebras to MV algebras algebraically, okay? I'm not reading the entries here. But all that I did in the Boolean case, I can do in the MV case, in the, in the vague case. And w why is this interesting? Is it just uh, one of these uh, 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 crazy generalizations that we mathematicians do? No, usually ma we mathematicians don't do crazy generalizations. You generalize not because you want to drop an axiom. That's a, that's a caricature of what mathematicians do. You generalize because you want to generalize some concepts, right? And the point here is that MV algebras are to bounded, bounded, real random variables, precisely as Boolean algebras are to zero one valued random variables. Or in other words, the logic corresponding to MV algebras, Vukasiewicz logic is to bounded real random variables, precisely as classical logic is to classical events. Yes, no events. If you want to go from events to random variables, you can go the semantics way, study probability theory, they will tell you what random variables are and so on. But if you want to keep the connection to logic, you need to drop classical logic and go to many-valued logic. So in fact, by studying the, in, and this is a different story, by studying the intended, the intuitive semantics of these 
real continuous, uh, these uh, real bounded va uh, random variables when you connect them to Vukasiewicz logic, the final claim would be that Vukasiewicz logic is to vague events. So th they're not random variables anymore. They're regarded as events themselves because they're described by single formula in a logic. Precisely as classical logic is to yes, no events. That's a hint of the non-classical fallouts, but I didn't have time to do more. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. And so other questions? Rich. I have a rather vague question, um, which is, uh, why should decision theorists care about vagueness? I, I mean, so, so we, you, there's a very, I mean, so the, in a way, the, the, the book, uh, the betting example is a sort of answer, but, but it's a sort of toy example. I, I, I struggle to think of a case where, um, you know, I'm in a sort of ordinary decision problem, as it were. I'm worried about vagueness because I, I sort of choose my, my terms in which I describe my problem so as to be precise about the things that are going to matter. Yes, that's, that's a very important point more generally about science. Why should a scientist be interested in vagueness? Because uh, in fact, if you read Frege, he makes a big deal of how science evolved to, to kick vagueness out of consideration. Uh, it's a long story, and I, I, I mean, the short answer is about decision theory, I don't have a clue. I hope in two years to have an answer, because, I mean, when Thomas comes and we, we do the, the, I mean, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I, I was, I'm not, I'm not developing um, these logics for decision theory. I'm developing them for their own sake. I, I, maybe somebody else can, can, surely they have better intuition whether it could be useful or not. Um, one thing to stress is that, um, this, is, this logic allows you to make vagueness precise. I mean, it is as precise as classical logic. It has a deduction uh, apparatus. It has completeness theorems. You can compute with them. You can do SAT problems. So it's not uh, like, it shouldn't be thought of as something, oh, we want to be sloppier. It's that sometimes you want to, you want to be uh, sort of, you, you don't want to betray the genuine semantics of, uh, of vague predicates. Uh, while retaining the ability to be precise about them. Uh, it's, it's a tricky thing. So, but I, I don't know in the specific case of decision theory. Are there more questions? Comments? Well, if not, let's thank answer again. Hey! Aspetta che ti giro così li vedi. Ammazza che invidia!